Okay, to get an idea of how fast I should go through some of the material that was gone over at DEF CON 16, how many of you actually attended the DEF CON 16 speech? Raise your hand. Okay, so a pretty good, good number. So we'll go through it pretty quick. So anyways, our old humor was the whole like series of tubes of Ted Stevens, but this year since I said like, you know, shacking doxis, I'm like, okay, are you saying like we're, you know, shacking up with our modems or something? I don't, I don't know, but anyways, it's uh, so you guys already know the backgrounds of uh, most of you. I do research with CERC. It's actually what was CERC. Now it's S squared ERC, Security and Software Engineering Research Center, which is uh, National Science Foundation, Industry, University Cooperative Research Center. And this is by my taco. He's a root admin over at uh, SB Hacker. And at DEF CON 16, we covered DOCSIS 2 and below. And our last speech actually led to a you know, huge number of people coming over to the SB Hacker forums and discussing the modem technology to include ISPs and you know, contractors and everybody else. So what we're going to cover, pretty similar format to our last talk, is our requirements for our examples. We're going to do a previous speech overview which I'll try to get through rather quickly since most of you are already familiar with it. Then we'll get into DOCSIS 3. I'm going to touch a little bit on packet cable. Then I'm uh, going to go over the United States versus modem hackers. If you guys didn't know, after our DEF CON 16 speech, a number of people got arrested for, uh, you know, making and uh, selling modified modems. Then we'll go over some of the new tools and, of course, the new firmware and then kind of basically leave it open for the future. So what do you need for our examples? A coax connection to the cable company. Now, uh, everyone wanted me to stress that had seen the last speech that I'm talking about a legitimate connection to your cable company because I guess supposedly I was, you know, telling people to climb poles or something but I'm actually not. I'm saying, yeah, go ahead and pay for your connection to your cable company. In SPIJ tag cable, uh, then you ha there's a number of modems. Last time we were focused on the uh, 5100 or the 5101. Now we're talking about the surfboard 6120, SPV 6220, DPC 3000, all DOCSIS 3 cable modems. Some soldering skills, or if you don't have soldering skills, SB Hacker actually sells, you know, pre modified modems, so then you can get around that. Then, of course, tools for flashing, which there's a number of those USB JTAG NT, Haxomatic, which is a new thing from SB Hacker, and you can always, you know, do it yourself cables. So, as we covered last time, why is it possible? Well, manufacturers didn't really put any physical security into the modems. So it made it really easy to modify them. The software, you know, the software was very easy to modify as well. Then of course the ISPs, CMTSs aren't configured properly. There's security flaws in CMTS and uh, in the iOS. And my stance is really, is Doxis really even a good platform? I mean, in terms of security, I would say no. <laughs> but you know, it's still, they keep pushing out new versions of it, new specs, and in my opinion, it's not getting any better security-wise. But you know, it's still in use, so you can still do this. Quick uh, cable network overview. You've got, you know, your co uh, cable modem termination systems, uh, which is where your internet connection is going through. Your customer database is where it's going to do a lookup, and that's based on your, you know, your MAC address. You know, your operation support system is basically you call in and you have a problem, then they can, you know, hook into that, look at the CMTS, see power levels, all that good stuff. And then we have your nodes are basically, you know, out there in your neighborhoods. So the big thing we pushed last time, we're talking about anonymous internet access and we used Comcast. Comcast is still the largest ISP, so we're still using Comcast. The whole idea is if you take a modem that's not tied to an account and you hook it up online, it's going to ask you to sign up for service. But if you change the DNS servers, and I don't know why this still works. I actually figured they would have done something to change this. But for some reason, this still works. You change the DNS service, or servers and you're online with a, com you know, a modem that's not tied to an account or anything. You're completely online. So then you have some other things you can do you know, with config files to get it faster or then you know, we have disabling SNMP and things like that just to be a little more anonymous so that they won't be able to detect you as easily. Then once you get your anonymous access, like I said, a lot of this is all review, but anonymous access is good, but faster anonymous access is better. And as uh, Taco says, you know, don't forget kids, the faster you download, the bigger your penis is. Everybody knows That's everybody. my forum like, signature. Uh, sure. <laughs> For the Every, past three years. Everybody's got a big E penis. <laughs> so uh, one of the, the funny things to me is that even after our last talk, 
and we're, we're pretty much showing them how this is all working. So we've got a Doxis 1, that's really not so much in use. Um, you can still use it on most of the networks. Then you got Doxis 1.123. The, the config files from the last talk are still working on Doxis 3. Th to me, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> I mean, but hey, whatever, you know. I guess they're still making money, so they're happy. Hacks are where, uh, you know, basically you go to it, it's got a web interface, you can configure all that stuff. When we spoke last time, it was pretty much like a beta type thing. As far as we know, all the bugs have been worked out. It's very stable, it's very good. Uh, we have a huge following over it. I think it's, you know, personally, it's, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of the, the Sigma firmware. Then we go techniques for remaining anonymous. Like I said, still just going through review. Disable SNMP. Hide the modem's HFC IP address. These are just commands you can do to um, do that stuff. Hide the reported software version. You know, because if you're using like some weird software version that isn't what they, because they'll actually push out updates to your modem, so you want to try to match that. Because if you don't match that, they're like, hey, why, you know, we push out an update to this modem, why is it on a different, you know, software version? So all these uh, settings, you know, basically put them in and it will make your modem look more normal. That's the whole idea. You want to just kind of lay under the radar. Cloning, I know SB Hacker really against cloning. I still said I want to go over it real quick. Uh, yeah, you can clone modems. That's pretty much, I think, viewed by everyone as just really illegal because you're taking someone else's modem settings and for like a true clone taking their certificates and actually cloning that with your modem and getting on under their account. And so, you know, and especially in, in the nature that we can get on anonymously, why would you really want to clone someone? But we'll just leave it at don't do it. <laughs> uh, so that's a uh, quick overview of that, that because they're on different CMTSs, you can clone them. Like you couldn't clone someone that's on the same CMTS as you. That's really the only, uh, only restriction that you have. And then, actually, I think I'm just going to skip through this just because it's, it's on the CD. If you want to do cloning, like we're, we're pretty much saying don't do it, but if you really want to, the information's there. <laughs> and uh, this is always interesting to me is uh, people always ask me, well, how anonymous are you? And from what I can tell and from texts that I've talked to, people that work higher up some of the ISPs, they can pinpoint down to a node is what I call a node, like a CMTS, a yeah, a neighborhood, but not a specific house. Or a tap. Or a tap. So if you're like, a, you know, you're a big convicted hacker and you have a record, this might not be so anonymous for you <laughs> because maybe if you pull off some large hack and they actually say, okay, we go to this IP address, it's not tied to an account, but we know it's in this general neighborhood, are there any convicted hackers that live around here? <laughs> Well, you know, there your name pops up. So it's, I think it's still fairly anonymous, but it's not perfect. There's also um, some ISPs will pull for poor signal levels. So the solution we gave is to use a drop amp. We had a pretty good response from that for people that were trying this stuff out, said they were able to maintain good signal levels. Nobody had any, you know, any Comcast trucks or party vans or anything coming out and giving them a hard time. Uh, the ISPs sometimes do perform routine audits. I mean, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, you know, your neighbor gets cable or something, the guy goes up there. If he's a contractor, he probably doesn't care. If it happens to be somebody that does care, they might look and say, hey, that tag's not supposed to be hooked in and unhook it. And then, you know, some ISPs have adopted and implemented at a cost, regional operating centers. I think you said South Florida? Yeah, Somewhere? South okay. Florida. He'll get into that later, but <laughs> most of them haven't. So, list of precautions. If you're going to play around with this stuff, doing the, you know, diagnostic modem and actually putting modems online, personal precautions, I'd say don't transfer personal information over unencrypted connections, ever. Make sure BPI is enabled. Yeah. Uh, BPI enabled? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, keep an eye out for the party van. It's like to say, cable technicians, FBI, whatever, you know, you see like a bunch of Comcast trucks coming, you might, you know, start unhooking your modems. Uh, <laughs> ju just a word of advice. Uh, Pay for service. I, I really, and I, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I strongly feel that if you're paying for the service, then it is going to be a lot harder for them to say that you're actually breaking the law. I think at the point that you're paying for service and you're putting another modem online, it's technically a terms of service violation, but not a theft of service. I mean, that's still arguable, but just saying it's better to pay for service. If you're actually paying for service, they're definitely not going to go after you as hard as they would if you're just blatantly, you know, climbing the pole, hooking it in, and ripping it off. 
use the modified modems to test confirm diagnose your existing service. That's the legitimate reason for these modems. So if you're buying them, that's what you're buying them for, not for any bad stuff that you might happen to do. Be mindful of HFC MAC addresses you may choose to clone. I'm actually going to say precautions don't clone modems. <laughs> but that was uh, a couple years ago we were, you know, giving people maybe potentially bad advice. <laughs> And uh, yeah, okay, the next one don't don't do that. That's uh that's leftover. Don't don't cut line identifiers off of uh, cable lines. So the the previous firmware <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Like I said, we were a little riskier at DEF CON 16 and we're trying to, you know, we want to because all the uh, people were arrested, we're really trying to get this to be more legitimate. If if we have everyone, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. It's there a, are plenty <laughs> of legitimate uses. Sure, there really sure. are. Just saying, if we have people running around cutting tags off and hooking up modems, and you know, uh, get it somewhat legitimate. So uh, the the old uh, firmware had all these different things it could do. I'm actually I don't even really want to go over those. We already went over the anonymous internet and that stuff. Like I said, it's all you can read it. And at this point, I would like to hand over to Taco and let him start going over Doxis three. You want that mic or this? Here we go. I'll take it. Hey, everybody. Um, so, uh, DOCSIS 3 has uh, been certified by Cable Labs since our, our last presentation. Um, basically, it's just DOCSIS 2 with uh, channel bonding, uh, native IPv6, like it says, and uh, optional AES encryption. Before, they've been using 56 bit DES for uh, BPI and BPI. Um, as far as the RF stuff goes, uh, DOCSA systems like in America, South America use a 6 megahertz wide channel for the downstream. Uh, it can handle 43, mega, uh, 43 megabits uh, per downstream channel. Um, Euro DOCSIS, if you're lucky enough to live in Europe, they have 8 megahertz channels, can handle about 55 megabits per channel. Um, DOCSIS 3 spec calls for a minimum of 4 downstream and 4 upstream bonded channels. Um, so basically, you're getting uh, a lot more speed. Um, let's see here. So I had a little too much to drink before you come up here. It's okay. Um, in America, basically, if you have a, a four channels down, you're going to get up to 160 megabits, depending on what your your cable operator offers. The potential for up, most upstream packages now get 10 to 15 megabits. The potential is for um, about 120. That will come sometime in the future. Um, the basic uh, foundation of, of DOCSIS 3 is the two uh, competing uh, companies, Broadcom and Texas Instruments. Before, with DOCSIS 2, Texas Instruments had a garbage chipset. Motorola had a big fiasco with them. Um, the 5120, it was a piece of shit. Uh, Comcast started pulling them from the field, blah, 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 long story short. Um, Broadcom was the leader. Well, now with DOCSIS 3, Texas Instruments released the Puma 5 chip long before Broadcom released theirs. It's an uh, ARMv6 architecture. It runs MontaVista Linux, open source, of course. Um, right now, there are uh, four channels down, four channels up bonded on that CPU. Uh, TI just recently released uh, an 8x4 uh, Puma 5 chip, meaning eight channels down, four channels up, to compete with the Broadcom BCM3380, which is 8x4, which was really late to market, and the current firmwares for all those modems have a lot of bugs. Um, and that runs on ECOS and its MIPS. Uh, how many people here have Hacksaware modems? Good, good, good. See a lot of hands. Y'all know uh, Ryko then, um, the uh, the uh, Serbian prodigy who wrote a hacks rare when he was 16 years old. Um, he's now 18 and he plans on doing a uh, do uh, Hacksaware 3.0 uh, probably around sometime around the end of this year for the uh, Broadcom modems. The uh, TI modems, um, you know, Linux open source, anybody can develop for it and, you know, we're trying to find more developers because the possibilities with that are, are quite endless. Uh, let's see. Um, every, every modem manufacturer has a Puma 5 modem out, Motorola, Cisco, Aris, Netgear, SMC, um, you name it. Um, and then the Broadcom modems. Uh, the Motorola uh, SPG6580, it's a modem with a uh, Wi Fi in gateway. Um, they released it about a month ago to Best Buy at retail, and they've already stopped shipping it because of so many firmware bugs. Um, they released it with a, uh, a serial port and a JTAG port, um, which they should have known better because, you know, this modem hack has been going on since, what, 2002, 2001. 
Um, the, the next batch is supposed to have that stuff removed and hopefully some firmware bugs fixed. Uh, my favorite Broadcom one is the Cisco DPC 3010. Works pretty well. The Thompson, piece of shit, but you know, it's an option. Um, the DCM is Doxis, the TCM is Eurodoxis. Let's see. Oh, and yeah, um, you know, uh, Ecos, MIPS, you got to have somebody who's, uh, Ryko codes everything in assembler. He plans on, um, you know, doing hacks aware. But the, uh, the Puma 5, I think, is going to be the, uh, the big popular thing since anybody can develop for it who, you know, is a Linux developer. Uh, as far as American Doxis 3 offerings, Comcast has the most D3 offered in America. You know, competitor to Fios and um, other fiber to the whatever services. Uh, Comcast, you know, for 100 bucks a month or 80 bucks a month, you get 50 megs down, 10 megs up. There's a 100 meg down, 10 meg up business package, and it's about $300 a month. Um, if you hack your 6120, you can pull 120 megs down and 15 megs up. Uh, you can. I'm not saying you should do that. Um, Charter. Um, yeah, I don't wear a Comcast shirt. I don't have Comcast. It's just more for the irony. Um, Charter has a 60 meg package, uh, 175 meg coming soon. Uh, Cablevision up in New England, they have a, they claim the fastest uh, internet in America, 100 and what, 101 megs down for 99 bucks a month. It's pretty cool. Um, Time Warner, Roadrunner, they are very slow in deploying Doxus 3 right now. They've hit New York City, um, I think Dallas, but they are dragging their heels. So if you've got Time Warner, I feel sorry for you. I actually, I, I have Charter. I just got Doxus 3 about a month ago, and I love it. Uh, it's great. And then, oh, in Europe, um, some of those companies are already offering the eight channel bonded downstreams. There's not that in the USA yet. Uh, one of my friends in Norway pulls about 170 megs down uh, with a 6120. Uh, it's pretty sick. <laughs> And the potential, uh, it's a, a potential with eight, eight channels bonded downstream is about 400 megabits. Yeah. Um, packet cable. They, um, they really want me to talk more about this than I should. Um, just as a proof of concept, packet cable is, it, anyone have cable phone service, Comcast Digital Voice? It, that, that's run on packet cable, which uh, runs on top of Doxis. Um, Basically, with a permission of, of the phone line owner, I was able to, in a couple of hours, hijack their phone line completely. Uh, no need to clone the MAC address. By simply cloning the, the FQDN, which is the fully qualified domain name, and a couple of pieces of information, you can hijack somebody's phone line who has cable phone service. And uh, that's not something I recommend you do. Uh, I did it just to prove it could be done, and there's a lot of uh, flaws in packet cable. I, I think it's more so. Um, vulnerabilities in the call management servers, not necessarily packet cable, but packet cables like Doxis, there's inherent flaws in it. And, um, you know, basically somebody pisses you off and you know enough information, you can hijack their phone and, you know, use your imaginations on that one. Let's see. I'm going to pass this back to Blake to talk about some of the people who have been arrested uh, since 2008. Um, there you go. <laughs> All, this, uh, all these people getting arrested, actually at the end you'll see a, a very important lesson that is uh, from one of my friends. He's actually in prison right now, unfortunately, but over, uh, if anybody heard of the TJ Maxx hacks, uh, Stephen Watt. And so I got a picture from him to, to show you guys, just to push a message to uh, everybody, you know, the hacker community in general. We got uh, Tom Swingler, AK Mass at all. He was the first guy that was arrested. I think it was actually like big enough. It ended up being on G4 Hack of the Show or whatever. But uh, he's got a nose job. <laughs> so, anyways, that heavy media attention. The the case ended up being dismissed after six months without any official reason. But what ended up happening is Massadog then snitched on Mass Mods. So you also had TCNISO. You guys. Uh, Anybody who went to our last speech heard about them. They kind of started a lot of the cable modem hacking in general. That's Ryan Harris, a.k.a. Duringel. He was arrested in October of 2009, generally regarded the godfather of cable modem hacking. How did he get arrested? Snitched on by D-Shocker. He's currently out on bond awaiting trial. So we'll go on to the... Um, Duringel actually literally wrote the book. It's called Hacking the Cable Modem. Um, no Starch Press pr uh, publishes it. They probably have it in the vendor area, but um, literally he, he wrote the book on it. And... Uh, he was the big fish, and they busted him based on a snitch. And we, we believe that he's innocent, 
but you know, that's sure. my opinion. <laughs> so then you have massmods.com, Matthew Dollery, arrested February 2010. He advertised pre-configured, sorry, pre-configured modems to steal service from Comcast, which is obviously a no-no. You don't say, hey, still Comcast here. But still again, he was raided after being snitched on by Mastodog. He's expected to plead guilty, of course, the way the case is set up. You have a, what's that? Uh, this guy, he's so freaking stupid. He was on YouTube with videos how to steal from Comcast, how to steal Dish Network with an FTA box. On his forums, he had tutorials on how to get away with murder. Um, he sold lock picks. Th this guy's just a freaking moron. So he, he's getting what he deserved, but um, yeah, he got snitched on. So that, sure. that's the bottom line. So we had the very small bust in South Florida where theft of services apparently. In, in South Florida, there's a joke that um, trafficking illegal cable modems has taken over uh, popularity in trafficking cocaine. <laughs> so, and the people in the uh, retirement homes down there are sitting there with you know chrome rims on their wheelchairs, you know soldering up modems and shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a couple key things is all the current arrests have involved theft of service. Um, you know, selling pre-configured devices that are set up to still service. Except for Duringle, he's innocent. Okay, well, except for Duringle. <laughs> and using modems for legitimate diagnostic purposes is still, by our belief, completely legal. The key factor that I like to, you know, point out is that the majority of rest have been by snitches. So it comes to my next slide, which um, he wants me to send a picture to this, uh, to him in prison. So if anyone <laughs> takes pictures of this, can uh, actually email it to me. But that's a brief message from Stephen Watt. He gave a speech at DEF CON 10 with uh, Gobbles and Silvio, and he's a Unix terrorist, but he's basically saying, hey, stop snitching. That's why, you know, half of you guys end up going to jail is, you know, narc each other out. If everybody would just not, you know, say things half the time, they wouldn't even have, you know, sometimes I have evidence, but a lot of the times they wouldn't. Now we're going to go ahead and go into the new tools and firmware, which Taco is going to cover that. Ready? Okay. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, bouncing back. Um, okay, we got the uh, the Motorola 6120 out about a year ago. Started playing with it. Um, we went over before. I had an orange modem with me, the Motorola factory diagnostic modem um, with the shelled firmware. We had that firmware before the modems even came out, and. Um, Basically, uh, Duringle, uh, the guy from TCN ISO, for a while was working on something called Dream OS, which is going to be a Linux based operating system that could just do anything. It never came to fruition since he got busted, but um, lo and behold, Texas Instruments released uh, their, their reference firmware for all the Puma 5 modems, MontaVista Linux. And so basically, they gave us Dream OS, uh, a fully capable diagnostic firmware, um, to consumers, and, and that's very cool. Um, Let's see. Uh, we're just, we don't have a name for the firmware yet. Um, nothing cool like hacks or where we're just calling it SBH Alpha. Uh, we're on build 1.1 right now. Um, it's kind of like, you know, DDWRT, OpenWRT, anybody can develop for it. You know, Motorola and all the manufacturers, they've released their source code, but I'm going to say this and hopefully this is not, you know, slander, but they're all in violation of the GPL because they have not released compilable sources. They've not released the MontaVista tool chain. Whatever they're releasing can be compiled, but it won't run on the ARM ar architecture. So hopefully maybe someone in this room can help us get Motorola to stop violating the GPL. Anybody? Lawyers? No? I'll talk to EFF. Um, last time we spoke here, there were about 25,000 users on the SP Hacker forum. As of today, we have about 69,000, uh, close to 70,000 people on our forum. And um, let's see. Uh, uh, talk to Ryko. He plans on making Hacksaware 3.0 for their Broadcom modems uh, sometime around the end of this year. So um, those of you who have Hacksaware know that's going to be freaking awesome. Um, and then uh, Doxus 2 modems mostly used uh, parallel flash chips, and we mod we used uh, JTAG to flash those. All of the new modems, Doxus 3 and whatnot, have SPI flash chips. So we've had to switch over to new programmers that support in SPI and system programming. Uh, there's the USB JTAG NT. It's a proven device. It's very good. Um, Ryko, the guy who did Hacksaware, has been working on for mm, six months to a year the Hacksomatic using a FTDI chip. It does JTAG, SPI, and it has a uh, serial port, USB to TTL. It's uh, all in one. I actually have one right here. It's a really small. Um, oh, there's a picture of it there. <laughs> Um, 
And then you can that works with Tom's JTAG utility, um, the software that Ryko's writing, um, blah blah blah. You can build your own um, parallel port SPI programmer, but uh, that's for yeah, all the new modems have SPI flash chips basically. Let's see. Uh, the SPH Alpha firmware, we really didn't have to do a whole lot to it because Texas Instruments gave us uh, basically everything we need. We just modified some of the scripting so you can force your own config file. Um, disabling firmware updates from your ISP is automatic. If you want to enable it, you can do so. Um, disabling SNMP so they can't pull your modem after it's online. Um, Ryko actually. Ryko's a MIPS guy. He doesn't know ARM, uh, but he actually figured out how to disable BPI plus and BPI. So we're using that for people who choose to do so. Now, if you disable BPI, um, all of your traffic goes over the network unencrypted, and the nature of uh, HFC networks is that your neighbors can sniff your traffic. And if it's not encrypted, your email passwords and anything not secure is going to be, you know, a vulnerable to your neighbors running Wireshark or whatever. Um, um, at DEF CON 16, there's a packet omatic speech. Guy Martin. Guy Martin. So there actually has a tool to uh, sniff Doxis traffic. If anybody's interested, you can look that up. Yeah, he gave a speech at the same time we did at 16. And uh, a lot of uh, Doxis engineers were very concerned after they saw the video of it. And they've all started enabling BPI. It took Charter, uh, BPI has been around since 99. It took Charter about 10 years to enable it. But, um, you know, they were bankrupt, so can't blame them. Um, Demo. Oh, let me see. Um, we have the uh, one of the checks they use now is um, checking your firmware version. Uh, we have the latest firmware for this. Basically, we're working with Motorola 6120 firmware. The, the latest version is spoofed, so it reports to the cable company you're running the latest firmware version. Um, we're trying to add a feature where you can change it to whatever you want. Like in Hacksaware, you can spoof any modem you want, and it looks like you're running that modem. And um, Right now, there's no web GUI like with Hacksaw you can change all the settings. It has to be done via, uh, you know, serial port or SSH. There's two reasons for that. One is because Hacksaw invited a lot of morons who don't not even know how to run a computer into this community who started stealing service and just trying to ruin the hobby for everybody. Um, so one of the reasons is that the other reason is uh, tool chain issues. Um, like I said, some of those companies are violating the GPL, not releasing the MontaVista tool chain. We only know one person with a uh, working tool chain for the uh, Puma 5, but I'm sure plenty of people in the audience here are, you know, gifted Linux developers and could write their own tool chains. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to set up a demo and show you guys the 6120 shell and uh, the Hacksomatic. And Blake's going to go over a few things. Yeah, well, you guys are doing that. What I was going to say is uh, how many of you guys, maybe a show of hands, heard of DDWRT? Or any of that type. So this is the kind of the same thing. What's going on with this now that you have Linux on your modems? You have a like a whole you know world of potential that you could do. So you can port all this stuff to it, run all different types of tools and whatnot. So what SB Hacker is really looking for is to get more people that could you know build things like what was built into DDWRT to put this onto the modems and really give you a lot of power on your modems. And I mean, who knows what all. I mean, I don't know uh, if they could handle Snort or, or whatnot, but I remember, you know, there are people using like DDWRT with Snort and things like that. All, so. all the current modems have eight or 16 meg flash chips and 32 or 64 megs of RAM, so there's plenty of power there to be used. So that's really, you know, looking for people to get more involved with this project. That's the the new, you know, with the new surfboard hacker firmware, since it does run on Linux. The idea is instead of having just like one guy coding it, like Ryko, actually having a community of people contributing. And helping to de uh, develop it. Oh, and this is the Motorola SB6120. This is the most popular uh, Doxis 3 cable modem you can buy it at Fry's, Best Buy, whatever. It's the most popular one. It's really hacked, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. I'm going to load up. Uh, oh, this, it has a uh, breakout board installed on it. We've got a, um, a USB to serial port, and we've got a, uh, a little port here for flashing the uh, SPI chip. And inside, it's wi the, uh, the board is wired directly to the SPI chip. And uh, when we power it on and cut the cable, uh, it cuts the power to the CPU. For those of you who are familiar with SPI programming, uh, so you can program the chip directly. And it's quite a, a bit faster than, um, than using JTAG. Is this going to work?
I got bootloaders decompressing the firmware, starting all the processes. Oh, it's it's maximized. Uh, oh, it, you're not you're not missing anything. Let me, um, and this has a uh, a BusyBox Linux shell and also a Texas in, uh, Texas Instruments uh, shell. Okay, here we go. Um, so what TI has given us is basically, like I said, fully capable diagnostic firmware. If you type, you go into the shell and type in prod show. Uh, oops. You got the um, you know the hardware revision, serial number. Um, uh, file names for spoofing firmware versions, change the modem's IP, uh, the MAC addresses. Um, basically, and then if you type um, prod set, you can go in and change all those parameters um, and then uh, save it and it's very simple, you're done if you want to change something. Uh, let's see. And outside of that we have the standard um, BusyBox Linux uh, Linux console here. Um, okay, so basically, it, you know, it's it's very powerful. You know, Linux on a modem, you know, do whatever you want with it. Um, next, I'm going to show you guys Hacksomatic. Uh, after Hacksoware, Ryko has been working on um, this programmer, like we talked about, the Hacksomatic does SPI, JTAG, and has a serial port as well. Uh, where is it? He was up apparently all night last night programming this for me, just yeah, as a DEF CON demonstration. And there's a lot of people who are working with this FTDI chip, making their own programmers. This one's just targeted for, uh, it does cable modems, uh, Xbox 360 NAND, um, anything with SPI. He, I know he programmed a, a Foxconn motherboard BIOS with it. He programmed an Acer, uh, one of those new 3D monitors with it, just because just, just he felt like it. No, USB JTAG has a, a Cypress chip and some other chip in it. This is FTDI, just one chip. Uh, I have a USB JTAG NT with me. Just, it, it's a good thing, but the software sucks. It really does. This software is, is um, you know, GUI and uh, it's trying to be, you know, more user friendly. And this is actually about twice as fast on SPI reads and a little bit faster on writes. Uh, it, re it generally reads about two megabytes per second. Um, and writes the 6120 will write about 200k a second. Um, the newer expansion flash chips will write about 475k a second. But I do not have one of those modems with me that has one of the newer chips. So I plug it in. It cuts the power to the CPU. And let's see. Oh, the Hacksomatic lets you choose your uh, your clock speed for uh, programming right 30 megahertz right now. And detect. We've got a uh, expansion flash chip, and then just uh, reading the flash right now. Um, right now, he's still finishing up the software. Um, we're beta testing it, and um, see, it's it's pretty fast. Red eight megs right there. Um, so we're going to put this into mass production um, once the software is finished, and it's uh, it's it's a really cool device. So I just read the whole flash. I can write it back. I can program any of these areas, flash the firmware, whatever, what have you. Um, there's another application that does, um, you can program PIC controllers as well. Uh, basically anything that this chip will handle. Let's see. Oops. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out where we left off. Already went over that we, stuff. There you go. Oh, new tools. Yep. Um, there's some various tools that some of our admins and members have written. This is called this one as SNMP cert, cert grabber. 
will scan the uh, HFC network for modems that are in factory mode. If it finds one, it'll uh, grab the certs, the max, and um, whatever you need if you're going to be cloning. Uh, of course, like we said, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There may be the way, the way I it, see this. If you pay for, you know, say Comcast, you pay for 50 megabit service. You're paying 100 dollars a month. If you want to run a diagnostic modem, for whatever reason, it shouldn't matter. You're paying them, and you know it, it's not illegal. It's just against the terms of service. And if they catch you, they will ban you for life. But it's not against the law. So <laughs> there you go. That that's the way I see it. But they probably don't agree with me because I called them monkeys last time I was here. And um, w there's a a Comcast executive who's like their head of uh, broadband, who's an active member of the SP Hacker Forum. And when noobs come on and say, "Oh, my modem's not working anymore. Why?" Blah blah blah. He comes on and talks shit to him and laughs at him. But um, they actually, Comcast and the rest of the big ISPs use our forum to find out what the holes in their system are and how to fix them. But so yeah, we've had they, to. But <laughs> they failed to fix them after two years. This so. is true. Um, how much time do we have? Um, I thought after speaking, uh, you know, in 2008, that they would immediately increase security. The major c companies, you know, Comcast, Charter, Time Warner, Cox, really have not started increasing security until this year. Um, enforcing BPI plus, which um, uh, verifies the MAC address based on a, a, a certificate, um, which is issued by VeriSign. Um, and, and the reason for all the security holes still is that they're still allowing DOCSIS 1.0 modems on their networks. DOCSIS 1.0 had no way to verify that. All it has is BPI, which encrypts your traffic, but they did not have BPI plus, which verifies the MAC and serial number to the certificate. And, and Comcast has. Um, Try to get rid of all the 1.0 modems on their networks, but there's still holes in Comcast because their walled garden is not configured correctly, and the rest of the ASP is just, you know, there's just so many holes in DOCSIS 1, and they don't want to spend the money to go out in the field and replace all these modems with DOCSIS 2 modems, 3, whatever. What's that? Depends on where you are, though. I, I've heard Cox Las Vegas is, is fairly secure, but it really depends. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have them, but I, I know people are hacking Doxus 3 on Cox, but it, some, some ISPs take more time than others to figure out how to do it. He's right. Um, this is a program uh, one of the other admins wrote that it allows you to back up. If you're going to hack your modem, you want to back up the uh, flash chip before you do that, because if you just fuck it up, you want to have an original backup. Um, if you don't have an SPI programmer, you can use this utility to back it up uh, via the virtual COM port through the. Uh, they're using the U boot bootloader for the Puma 5 modems. So uh, th that's pretty cool. People are wondering for all, how do I back up my full flash without buying the $60 programmer? Well, we have an application for it now. Um, Blake, do you want to talk about this? I can. I'll stay here. Um, <laughs> basically, the future, I, I'm not really sure what they're going to do about the problems of actually fixing them or not. But one thing that we had thought, you know, the botnets. The faster the home users' internet connections get, the the bigger threat botnets will be. If you think about it, like if botnets on like dial-up is not, you know, you have to have a huge number of machines actually cause, uh, you know, sufficient denial of service attack. If you have people on Doxis three with these really high speeds, all of a sudden you don't need, you know, as many computers. So that's right. always. Uh, I'm sure some of you have dedicated servers. Average you port speed is probably 100 megabits. Some of you have a gigabit. Uh, take, you know. 10 DOCSIS 3 modems on Comcast with 10 megs up, that's a 10 modem botnet to knock out your server. So uh, they just have to be really mindful of that because if uh, people are, you know, getting exploited and being used for botnets, it's, you know, it, it could get bad. It could get really bad. Or on the, on the other side, not just botnets, but if somebody, you know, were inclined to get a number of diagnostic modems and put them all online, like he said, put 10 diagnostic modems online and all of a sudden, you can start, you know, taking down pretty, uh, pretty heavy servers in terms of now service attack. Uh, also, with the futures of, I think there's a good possibility they're going to keep trying to to crack down on the the modem hacking, but it's it's kind of tough, and I haven't actually seen any real convictions. And that's what I'm wondering: what's going to happen with these cases? Yeah, Mastodog's case got thrown out. Um, Mass mods. He told me he's going to plead guilty, and he is guilty, so he should. Deringel will not plead guilty. He's going to go to trial if he has to. Um, I just lost my train of thought. You can go into the next slide if you want. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I had too much to drink. <laughs> I am so sorry. Um, Actually, skip this. Just role playing. It's not not too fun. All stuff we've already went over. Go on one more. Okay. Right again. There you go. Okay. So problems and solutions. One thing that we had brought up last time, and Docsys 3 does have in the spec for AES, but so far it doesn't look like many people are using it, is that if you're using like 56-bit DES, that's crackable. That's kind of you know scary for your privacy when you, you already have the packet-o-matic, right? So that can, can watch your traffic. Your neighbors can see your traffic if it's unencrypted. With the BPI plus, if it's just 56-bit DES, probably only a matter of time if somebody's motivated to actually you know, write a plugin for hack or packet-o-matic and you know, go ahead and start sniffing all the encrypted uh, Doxis traffic, which maybe people already are doing it. I don't, you know, I don't know. I want to add something. Hacksorware has the ability to create and generate a self-signed BPI plus certificate. So if you change your Mac, that was actually something that Motorola added to the SB4100, I believe. It's a Doxis one modem. They wanted it to be Doxis 1.1 compliant. So Motorola wrote these code where you can uh, sign your own certificates and. Um, we took that and uh, Ryko put it into Hacksorware. However, it doesn't really work because uh, Cisco, like a Cisco CMTS by default, will not accept self signed certificates. But uh, like, like say, a third world country where they want to have 4100s keep working, they will enable um, self signed certificates to work. And there you go. So there, there is code to generate the self signed ones. But if you want a real certificate, you got to get it from VeriSign. And nobody has uh, yet to crack BPI. Plus. Sure. And we had clone detection last time. Really hasn't been anything that I've seen that's come out to try to uh, really detect that with the actual perfect clones, meaning you actually clone the certificates and everything else. It seems like they're still getting, uh, getting away with it. So from my perspective, you know, situation for the ISPs is, is pretty bleak. That's why I said I don't really think Doxis is a good uh, protocol for in terms of security on providing people with internet access. I mean, it's great for us as hackers if you want, you know, anonymous internet or, you know, you want to be able to put as much stuff online as you want or get whatever speed you want, but from a ISP perspective, I'd say it's pretty bleak. I don't I don't see them coming up with any, you know, solution in the at least immediate future. The way I explain this to Blake, you know, Doxus 1.1 was certified about 10 years ago. Doxus 3.0 was certified in 2008. Basically, all the, the U.S. cable operators are running Doxus 1.1 networks with channel bonding. So they're not using, they're using 10 year old technology and just bonding the channels to give you more speed. And they're not using the AES security or, or anything else. So they're really, and it's mostly because their admins don't know what the hell they're doing. They're getting better at it because they're going to SP Hacker and seeing what they need to do to fix the holes, but they just don't know what the hell they're doing. Let's see. Okay. There's a little bit of stuff for you guys to remember. How to get anonymous fast internet on Doxis network. The equipment used. How to stay anonymous. Different firmwares. But at this point, pretty much, if you're using the older, like 51, 5101, you're talking about Hacksware. You're on the newer stuff. You know the Hacksware Alpha. Why it's possible. <laughs> hardware security. What Doxis 3 really is. You know bonding at faster speeds. And uh, development and reversing is as easy as your sister. It was added by Dev Delay. He couldn't make it here this year, but uh, uh, yeah, Dev spoke with us last time, but he couldn't make it out. But yeah, he added this and for the, us. And these, uh, you know, new security adoptions so far, so that they they can be defeated. It's kind of a thing with security. It seems to be this recurring trend of you keep having the same problems. You know, every time there's a new device or a new technology, it still has problems from the past, and it just keeps repeating itself. So people just keep breaking it. Uh, so you know, enabling one security feature on a CMTS may mean disabling or sacrificing another. It seems like every time Cisco releases a new code train for their CMTS IOS, you know, it you know creates new security and then opens up old bugs. Um, I know, and uh, Cable Labs has a tiered qualification system for the CMTSs. They have bronze, silver, and uh, gold, I believe, like Olympic medals. Um, Cisco and Aris, which is the majority of use in, in, in the world, um, they're all bronze certified, I meaning they can only do downstream bonding, not upstream. Um, 
Goal, uh, Casa Systems has gold certification for theirs, but they're really a small company and nobody's using them. I know I have a friend down in uh, South Florida who has upstream bonding, and he's the only person I know who has uh, four channels bonded upstream, but he still only gets five megs up. But it, it's coming, and you know, potential for upstream speed is. Doxis has become more symmetrical as opposed to the past, where it's been really asymmetrical. Thanks. Sorry about that. We have our thanks. We have a couple minutes left. Uh, all the anonymous network technicians that answered questions about OSS for me, uh, Deringle, you know, he essentially started this whole thing. So a big thanks to him for that. Got uh, Ryko, Dev Delay, Bad at eighty four, Detox, Scanman One, BM Hoff, Spender, Snaggle, Pierup, Cisco Ninja, the UT, and the entire surfboard hacker community. The anonymous cable modem hackers who shared their stories with us and actually gave us enough information to verify that that was the case. Of course, the manufacturers for creating such insecure hardware and software, sbhacker.net and soldierx.com. And thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>